we would uh, figure out how to deal with these patients who have a plaque in the epicardial coronary artery that is made up of scar, fibrosis, and calcification. It's not going away. Well, first of all, here's the data. What you're seeing over here is a PET rubidium dipyridamol scan. And you can see if it is orange or if it is yellow, that's good. But right here, where it's all green, that's poor. This was in a 60-year-old stockbroker from downtown Cleveland. At the time that he had that scan, on the left, I counseled him. 10 days later, his cholesterol was down to 137. Three weeks later, he got it back. We repeated the, the PET scan. Now it's all suddenly back in three weeks. Nobody, nobody ever gets rid of a plaque in three weeks. So let's think this through a little bit. You're now looking at a heart without any muscle. But you do see clearly the three major arteries that you can see here, the right coronary artery, the left anterior descending, and the circumflex, they are riding on the surface of the heart. They get all the publicity. They get the stents. They get the bypass. Where do they all go? They all dive intramuscularly. They dive into the heart muscle where they deliver oxygen and nutrients. And look, just look at the thousands and thousands of cascading, interlacing intramuscular arteries there are. So I went down and spoke with Rodriguez, who is the chairman of the cardiovascular pathology section, who dissects 200 hearts a year from the deceased. And I said, Rod, how often do you ever see, once the artery has dived into the heart muscle, how often do you ever see in those vessels, in the muscle, any good old standard garden variety coronary artery disease? His answer, never, never. Once in a very, very great while, in a severe diabetic. Other than that, never. Now we had our answer. Because think of it this way. When we see these patients, originally, we see these heart patients come to us. Their endothelial cell, obviously, are just so beaten down, they don't have enough nitric oxide. So they're hardly making any vasodilator. And of all things to have happen, when you're that mean to your endothelial tissue, it is now making two molecules, endothelin and thromboxane. Endothelin and thromboxane that are your enemy. They are vasoconstrictive. They're tending to constrict the artery. So when we see those patients, this entire cascade of intramuscular vessels are now pinched, narrowed in spasm from thromboxane and endothelin. So what happened was, if you saw just moments ago, when you really get these patients to aggressively do it right, and in addition to eating this way, they're chewing the green leafy vegetables six times a day, making as much nitric oxide as they can, immediately, it appears, your endothelial tissues stops making endothelin and thromboxane and starts, starts making more of the greatest dilator in the body, nitric oxide, that you can really begin to turn it around. And I can tell you where you see this clinically, so graphically, is if you've got a patient who has stable angina, because they can measure that themselves. Usually they go in a block, block and a half, two blocks, then they slow up because they get chest pain. They start this, suddenly it's three and a half to four blocks before they get chest pain. The next week or two it's now 10 blocks. What have you got? You've got them hooked absolutely hooked. And also they're hooked once they understand how they created the disease by destroying their nitric oxide. Can you imagine a single patient 
in our seminar coming up to me afterwards and saying, Dr. Esselstyn, God, that was kind of interesting about the endothelial cell and nitric oxide, but you don't seem to understand. Two weeks from now, Lois and I are having our 35th wedding anniversary, and boy, am I going to destroy some more endothelial cells. <laughs> what? <laughs> no. So, <clears throat> remember that endothelin and thromboxane, the vasoconstrictors, you get rid of those. All right. Now, here's a summary of the eight ways you can measure reversing heart disease. I've shown you the reversal of an angiogram. Happens with the stress test. I've just shown you the PET scan reversal. Talked about the ultrasound. Showed you the slides of the pulse volume. And of course, the symptoms disappear of angina, claudication, and erectile dysfunction. Now, I always like to wrap up my presentations with the picture of the building where for many years I was on the eighth, eighth floor as a surgeon, but I show it to you in Long Island because I want you to know what the trees look like in February in Cleveland. <laughs> <laughs> However, now that I've retired from surgery, I've, I've worked for a number of years at the Wellness Institute. The budget is more modest but the morale is high. <laughs> One thing I've learned 58 years from medical school, yep, brains, no question. Brains are important. But nothing, nothing, nothing seems to be as important as persistence, 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 best exemplified by this young damsel, Life Magazine, 1939, trying to learn how to do the splits. It's tough, it's tough, it's tough. But sure enough, the other day, in downtown Melville, was it, that Steve spotted her, and she had got it right. Uh, in conclusion, let me just say, uh, the reason that I'm so passionate still about the field of medicine, even though it's been about 20 years since I've retired from surgery, <clears throat> is that we are truly on the cusp of what could absolutely be a seismic revolution in health. And this seismic revolution in health is never going to come about from another pill, another procedure, or another operation. The seismic revolution in health will come about when we have the will and the grit and the determination to share with the public what is the lifestyle, and most specifically, what is the nutritional literacy that will empower them as a locus of control to absolutely annihilate chronic illness. Thank you.